there she is. <laughs> this is, and this is just how we're starting today's study. Um, here's what I want to want to do. First, let me just welcome you guys. This is this is uh, I'm Mike Winger. This is the Mark series. We're going through the Gospel of Mark verse by verse, and we just happen to be in a passage where Jesus deals with some things that heavily overlap. They intersect with the issues that we're dealing with in our politics right now. And I need to say this, um, this isn't going to be maybe what some people are expecting. And I'm not, I'm not intending to mislead with the title and thumbnail or anything like that. It's going to be about our politics. It's going to be about how what Jesus teaches impacts our politics, but it's not going to be what some people expect because they want, you know, they would, they're thinking I'm going to, I'll pick a side and then I'm going to defend the side versus no, my whole thing about politics that I want to do better and better, learn to do better, and maybe as I learn this, I could help others learn it too, is to start with scripture and then to become biblical in my politics, in my view of all things, and then to let that overlap into how I see what's going on in the culture and with voting and all that kind of stuff today. And so we're starting with scripture here. So this may not be what you're exactly expecting. We're going to go to the text. I'm going to read it to you now. This is Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. And there's way more details here. There's like way more info in the stuff that Jesus says about taxes and about Caesar. Um, there's a lot more info in there than we often realize. We're going to combine that with things in Romans and in and, and, uh, First Peter. This is going to give us, I hope, a more biblical view, at least in some areas on our political issues. And I'm going to be very open about how I think we ought to be applying these things into our lives today. So Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17, here we go. And this is part 47 of the Mark series. Now, now just for some of you, before I, hold on, before we launch into the text, for some of you, you're like, wait a minute, shouldn't this be part 46? Um, part 46, I didn't do on a Monday. It was a short 10 minute little video where I just talked about a textual criticism issue. Does Mark 11, 26 belong in your Bible? That's in the playlist. You can get the whole playlist down in the video description below um, or in in the footnotes or wherever you're at, depending on where you're watching this, you should be able to find the playlist and find part 46. If you want to see that little 10 minute uh, hiatus, we took that, that little excursus that we took. All right, here we are. Mark 12 verses 13 through 17. Jesus answers the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes. Um, actually, I don't know why the head, the titles in, in the in the NASB says Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes. In a sense, they're involved here, but the groups are the Pharisees and the Herodians, who we'll talk about in a minute. We, so just for those who don't know, right, we want to understand this passage in its context so that we can apply it into our lives today in our context. So we have to start with the scripture, start with understanding and unpacking the text. Then they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to him in order to trap him in a statement. They came and said to him, teacher, we know that you are a truth, you are truthful and defer to no one for you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. They brought him one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were amazed at him. Okay, this short little exchange is kind of infamous. Like, did you guys know <laughs> this short little exchange has made the ancient Roman denarius one of the most sought after coins that collectors are interested in? There's a lot of them, which is good. But but as I'm researching this, I'm finding out that just the references in the Bible that has just made this sought after coins. But more importantly, it's it's infamous because it really applies very directly into our lives and how we deal with government and and how we handle some of the tough issues, right? They're, they're paying taxes to Caesar that they think have immoral implications. And it's a question about whether or not they're going to, they should pay morally. Does God want me to pay or not? And then they also feel that, that there's a, a sense of blasphemy involved in paying taxes to Caesar. I'll explain that later. And Jesus, his answer to this question gives us answers to a lot. Then we're going to bring in other scriptures and here we go. This is the Mark series. And um, and just as a reminder, my name is Mike. It's the Mark series because we're in the Gospel of Mark. Okay. <clears throat> For those in the comments who think my name is Mark. Actually, I think half of you just like calling me Mark, which I also find amusing. Um, 
All right, now here's what we're gonna we're gonna do. Let's start with verse thirteen and just start to unpack this text and understand it. There's two groups that go to Jesus. He, they send him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to him in order to trap him in a statement. Now, the first question I get, and and for those who are are curious about like Bible study, like advice you know, tips and tricks for when you're studying the Bible. Here's one of the best pieces of advice I could give you is read a text of scripture and then just write down a bunch of questions. I mean, a bunch of questions. I think this has been something that is, it, I don't know that, I don't know if I was taught, I was, I was taught observation, interpretation, application, right? Like start with observations. Um, I actually almost think it's better to start with questions. So let me give you a list of some of the questions that I've written down in my original cursory study of Mark, just so you can get an idea how to like grease your wheels on this, this style of studying scripture. So I wrote, why are these two groups the ones that are sent to Jesus, right? The Pharisees and the Herodians. Why? Just a question. Who are the they that send them? They sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians. Who's the they? Who sent them? Another question, what's the goal of trapping Jesus in a statement? What is their agenda here? Can I understand what's going on behind the scenes? What, what's the what's the agenda? Um, why did they compliment him before before trying to trick him? What's the purpose of this drawn out, like over the top compliment that they give Jesus? How how do those compliments relate to trapping Jesus in his answer? Uh, these are all just questions I wrote. Out. How is this a trap? Exactly. Um, why does Jesus say, "Why are you testing me"? Why why does he say that? He doesn't have to say that. Here's another question. Should I should I conclude anything from the fact that Jesus didn't seem to have a denarius on him? He requires them to give him a denarius. Does this does this give me info about Jesus and <clears throat> how much money he had or something like that? Does it or not? Um anyway, I can go down the list of questions. I'll be asking and answering these questions through the study, but it's just like a Bible study tactic where you 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 write down a list of questions. You brainstorm a list of questions as you first read a text of scripture. And then in, when you go back into it a second time to study it more carefully, you seek answers for those questions in context, answers in the surrounding context, and even answers in commentaries and in helps. So here we are, our first question, why these two groups? The Pharisees and the Herodians are the two groups that go to Jesus to trap him in a statement. And the Herodian, with the Pharisees, you guys already know a lot about. I've taught so much about the Pharisees. So we already kind of have a picture of the Pharisees in our heads, and we know they're opposed to Christ, and we understand some of those things. But the Herodians, we know very little about, and that's not just you. That's like we as in the, the planet Earth, right? We know very little about the Herodians. They're only mentioned three times in the Bible, and one of them is a parallel mention. So the parallel passage in Matthew where Jesus gives this tax teaching, that's where the Herodians are mentioned. Then in Mark 3, it's mentioned that the Herodians wanted to kill Jesus, right? That the Pharisees and Herodians were plotting together to destroy Christ in Mark chapter 3. Um that's about all we know about the Herodians as far as the use of their name in history. They're just not used in history. It's just like in the Bible. But we do know things about Herod. And so quick synopsis, I don't want to, I could do like, you could do like a whole study on, on these sort of rabbit trails. But the basic idea is Herod's the king of the Jews. And so Jesus being proclaimed Messiah is a threat to him personally. And if you know anything about history, you know that you don't want to threaten the Herods in their sense of security. They're rather insecure people. and <laughs> The Herods will kill you. And so Jesus being claimed the Messiah is seen as a political threat to Herod. And they're trying to use this question to make it look like a political threat to Caesar. This is very interesting. We'll get into the reasons why later. Another uh, issue there is that Herod is a Roman ruler himself. And in the Roman rulers, while he's considered a Jewish king-ish, not technically a king, but he called himself a king. He's kind of in this gray area. The, um, the Romans are actually the ones powering his power, right? They're the ones who are giving him his place. And so any sort of Jewish leader who is gathering the kinds of people Jesus is gathering, who are, many of them are zealots and they're very disgruntled about the government. This is not something that he's going to like. So he's going to want to shut down Christ. So the Herod Herodians are plotting against Jesus. That makes sense. Now, who are the they that send them? Who sends the Herodians and the Pharisees? Uh, the answer here, I think, is clear. I think it's the Sanhedrin. Remember, we've been dealing with the Sanhedrin for like two weeks now. Basically, the ruling sort of supreme court of the Jewish land in Jerusalem. They have the greatest amount of power. And Jesus is now in Jerusalem. And they're really, really wanting to push back against him, not only for his teachings, but for him clearing the temple, embarrassing them, and then giving all these backhanded statements to them. He's really been in their face. And they just want to, they want to get rid of him. He doesn't respect them. 
uh, as far as he respects their position, actually, he does, interestingly. He does not respect their character. He does not respect the things that they're doing. <clears throat> All right, so what's the goal then of trapping Jesus in a statement? Uh, the, the short answer, and this is in verse 13, they sent him in order, they sent them in order to trap him in a statement. The goal here is they want to either A, depopularize Jesus, because if they can get him to answer in the way that his followers don't like, then they can depopularize him. They can get people to not like him. Uh, we see attempts to do this constantly nowadays in the U.S. right now. We're in the middle of, uh, of an election that is one of the ugliest elections that at least is in my memory. Um, they all they all tend to get some amount of ugliness, but the ugliness is is has been growing, <laughs> and and the questions that are often asked of candidates are really uh, not questions for information. They're questions for ammunition, and we get this too. Christians get this. You know, people want to depopularize you by asking you hard questions and trying to find a way to use your answer against you. So we see this a lot during our election. We understand when you ask polarizing questions. It's to alienate this person from a, some some sort of support group, some base who's following them. That's what they're trying to do with Jesus. That's the depopularized part. If he says pay taxes, then a lot of his followers may actually not like him anymore. Now, on the other hand, if Jesus says don't pay taxes, then they can get criminal charges brought against him that he's he's bringing sedition against Rome. And this is not something that they tolerate. Okay, in the United States, we in our country are used to tolerating a rather significant amount of disgruntledness from our citizens. And especially this year, we but you see this toleration going on not in Rome. Okay, this is not going to happen in Rome. Like you you rebel against Rome like we 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 cut down trees, we build crosses and we we nail you to them. This is this is what happens. You want to you want to have a riot, you're just going to die. Okay, this is just what happens. So they're trying to get either criminal charges or depopularizing against Jesus. This is a heated, heated moment. And Jesus isn't afraid to die. He's not afraid to take a stand. He actually doesn't do what a lot of leaders will do today where he where he just kind of gets in the middle and doesn't answer the question. Instead, he does what I'm talking about today, biblical politics. He has biblical principles that inform his his teaching you know, he's going to give you the principles to live by that are grounded in scriptural truths. And then pushing forward, he's going to be um, uh, applying that into the question of taxes. So sort of what Jesus does is he takes the issue out of the political debate of the time and he applies it from a I'm committed to God perspective. And then the issue becomes more clear. And that's what we need to do with our politics. So Verse 14, he says, that it's, it says in scripture here, um, let me get us there. They came and said to him, teacher, we know that you are truthful and defer to no one for you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? Okay, my next question is why the compliments? Why the compliments? Now, the, now the answers might seem obvious, but it's worth it in your study time to labor at answers that may seem obvious because you can get deeper understanding on those issues. So why the compliments? Well, they're not sincere. We know they're not sincere because c context informs us. They, they come to trap him in a statement, that, right? This is the goal is to trap him. So these, these aren't sincere compliments. If they thought he was truthful, if they thought he didn't defer to anybody and all this stuff, then and he taught the way of God in truth. If they meant that, they'd be followers of Jesus, not trying to find ways to kill him. We also see in verse 15, Jesus uh, knows their hypocrisy when he answers them. He knows their hypocrisy and rebukes them for testing him in that fashion. So in this case, what's going on is flattery. And flattery, um, flattery is like, a, like the bait in the trap. And I'm going to talk about this in just a second, but you guys understand how flattery works. Flattery, you know, basically when you have someone giving you compliments and there doesn't seem to be a goodwill reason for them to give you those compliments, it's probably because they're trying to manipulate you. Salesmen do it all the time, right? I, mean, I know you're, you're, a good, you're a good dad who wants to protect your family and take care of your loved ones. And the next thing they're doing is selling you life insurance because what they've done is they've given you a compliment that is meant to push you into doing something they want you to do. And so, yeah, there's, there is that. That kind of thing. Hey, man, you've always been such a good friend. You've always been there for me. And you're thinking like, uh oh, they want to borrow my truck for moving again, don't they? <laughs> and and you know that like compliments from people who aren't just giving it out of goodwill are often manipulation devices. So Proverbs talks about this. I love when we can bring the book of Proverbs into our study. A man who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his steps. 
there you go. I mean, this is this is the idea of flattery. When flattery comes from, and it's not really flattery, it's just it's just honest compliments from goodwill, and there's no strings attached. That's a wonderful thing. That's a good thing. It's a kindness, and it's a positive thing. People people really can be built up by this when it's based on truth and not frivolous stuff. But flatter, flattery in the sense of flattery, where, where it's flat, <laughs> um, that it's it's spreading a net for steps. It's it's ultimately a manipulation tactic. So they're manipulating Christ. Um, they're manipulating Christ. Now, how are they manipulating him? That This is where it's kind of interesting to me. The, and hopefully you can understand this. Because what I want is I want the scripture to become like very, uh, this moment was alive. And it was, it was electrically charged with tension and meaning in every single step. And the way in which the flattery was electrically charged was alive is this. They tell Jesus, you're truthful, you defer to no one, which is another way of saying, Jesus, you always speak the truth and you're not afraid of anybody. The next thing they do is ask him a very, very controversial, like audience triggering question, the kind of thing that could start riots. I'll explain that in a minute. When they say, should we pay this poll tax or not? So if Jesus doesn't give an answer and he just did this to them, right? When they ask him about John the Baptist, he goes, I'll ask you a question. You answer me and I'll answer you. Well, they don't want him to do that anymore. They don't want Jesus to do this defer thing. They don't want a parable. So they're trying to trap him from doing a parable, from, from giving kind of a, a, a sideways answer where he answers it, but it's not something they can pin him down on. So they, t- they flatter him first. Oh, you're so honest and you're not scared of anybody. Should we pay taxes or not? Now, if he says, well, you know, um, you know, that's a good question. That's an important question for our time. And we ought to think, we ought to think about those questions, you know, and we ought to have good answers for them. And then he, and then he just dodges it. <laughs> then he's not truthful or he's afraid of people. That's what they're trying to imply. So they want to destroy his reputation or pressure him to answer, in which case it'll also potentially destroy his reputation or his life. So how does he answer? But he, knowing, um, sorry, let me put the scripture back up on screen. Verse um, 16 well, I guess I'll read their question again. Uh, they came and said to him, teacher, you're truthful. Oh, you're so truthful. You would never lie to anybody. You're you're not partial. You're not afraid of anybody. Should we pay taxes? Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? Notice how they asked the question twice because the second time they're like, yes or no? Yes or no? Uh, you get the idea that they're frustrated with Jesus having not answered their questions in the past the way they wanted. And they're trying to force a yes, no answer because that's the easiest thing to use. And <clears throat> here's wisdom, guys. Um, sometimes we still answer we still answer yes or no. And we'll get into this here. He answers with a clear yes, but he does it based on principles. He teaches a principle that is a clear yes. And here's something we should learn. In our difficult times, in our hard moments where people are challenging you with tough questions about, as a, on a Christian worldview, about the issue of homosexuality or abortion and these types of issues, Sometimes they want to go like, so are you saying this? Yes or no? And we maybe should answer with a principle instead of with just a yes or no. Because sometimes the principle is stronger than the yes or no. So, are you, are you, so you're saying a woman doesn't have a right to do with her own body? And, and if you're like, well, if I say yes or no, either way I'm falling into a trap. But if instead I say something like, I'm saying that every human life is immeasurably valuable and, and those who are strong need to protect the weak. And we all know what this means, right? This is a clear, um, you don't have a right to kill another person. You know, <laughs> that's that's not your body. But we're, and then we're doing it from biblical principles because this is just a biblical truth, a biblical reality that, that, that you just do not harm the innocent like that. But we answer with a principle instead of just a yes, no. And so it's giving us the ability here to follow Jesus in his cleverness and how he answers tough questions. Again, we're learning from him. He's educating us in how to be wise as serpents gentle as doves. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So this is the dilemma. This is the dilemma. Do we pay taxes or don't we? Now, let me talk about why this is a trap. Um, the The dilemma is, I, I kind of mentioned it already, but <clears throat> he's either going to get in trouble with the crowd or he's going to get in trouble with Rome. Some of the crowd that was following Jesus was ze- were zealots. In fact, we have Simon the Zealot was one of the followers of Christ, one of the disciples, one of the twelve. These people, when you say the zealot, we don't just mean they have zeal. That's just like a nickname they had. These are people who were like ready to rumble against Rome. They're like ready to take up arms and start the fight. It's a really tense environment, more tense than what we've got going on currently in the U.S., right? It was a very tense environment. And it did eventually, 
result in Jewish uprising and Romans smashing them down and the destruction of the temple. It ended up being that way. But this is the this whole first century is just very, very tense. There were multiple uprisings. There was all kinds of horror, just really tough stuff going on. The tension between the Roman leaders and the Jewish leaders and then them trying to jostle for an agreement over how much power each of them would have so that then they would influence their control over the people. All this stuff was just very tense. Now remember this. The reason why the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the reason why these people can't just kill Jesus up, just grab him and take him, is because he has too much crowd support. So a question that's meant to alienate him from his most ardent, potentially violent supporters is the thing that's going to then enable them to grab him and do what they want. So they're trying to remove his bodyguard in a sense. I mean, this is to put it, um, you know, bluntly. That's one issue. The other issue is trouble with Rome. They, Jesus could get in a lot of trouble with Rome. Uh, the poll tax isn't just about paying taxes. It's about more than that. So it's not a lot of money. It's it's a day's wage. Okay, it's one day's wage. That seem, may seem like a lot of money and whatever an average day's wage is, that's what a denarius was. It's agreed on. Okay, a denarius was a day's wage. Uh, but it was only paid once a year. The poll tax was paid one time a year. There were other taxes that people had to pay, but the poll tax was once a year. So it doesn't seem like the most significant tax. You would think if this was about money, then they would probably pick a tax that was more expensive, pick a, a larger taxing portion. But this particular poll tax was extremely controversial because to the Jews, it symbolized submitting to Rome and giving into Rome. And there were questions about it being blasphemous and, and immoral and all that sort of thing. So this is, this is a big deal because... Um, let me give an example. In like years prior to the time of Jesus, but still in the memory of the people, there was actually a Jewish rebellion triggered by the poll tax, by the single coin that everyone has to offer as part of a census of Israel, the part of the, the um, Roman just counting heads. But you'd offer the poll tax and it was a way of saying Rome is in charge of us. And this drove them to... Let's say they didn't like it, right? And so many of the Jews rebelled. We read about this in Acts 5, 37. I'll put this on screen for you. We also read about it in Josephus. So it's confirmed in that uh, historical work as well. It says, after this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census. This is not Judas, the uh, uh, the disciple. <laughs> this is a, a different guy. The Judas, Judas or Judah, actually, probably more accurately, is, is a very common name back then. So Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished and all those who followed him were scattered. There was the census, that was the poll tax, was part of the census. And it actually caused a revolt where there was a violent revolt. And they killed him, the Romans killed him, and then his followers scattered. So this is, again, it's confirmed by Josephus. James Brooks, in his commentary on Mark, says this. The tax amounted to only a denarius a year, a day's wage of an agricultural laborer. It was opposed at its inception by Judas the Galilean, who led an abortive revolt, and it was still deeply resented in Jesus' time. Deeply resented, that's the key. The tax was not hated because of its amount, but because it was a symbol of foreign domination. And because it had to be paid with a coin that bore an image of the emperor and an offensive inscription. We'll get to the image and the inscription later. This is pretty significant. And it, and I think it changes. Uh, it answers some moral dilemmas about those who are paying taxes to governments that do immoral things. So we'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> All right. So it's a big deal. The tax issue is a big deal. 40 years later, it's actually part of the reason why they rebel against Rome. And then the Jerusalem is, is wrecked and destroyed. The temple ends up being destroyed. Let's talk about Jesus' question. Jesus asks them a question here. He says, why are you testing me? Now, in my study, I almost just passed over this. I don't know why, but there's sometimes you're reading scripture and there's certain phrases that you, you've, maybe you just, you're familiar with. You just, you just pass over them. And so let's not pass over it though, because I think there's something really important here, an application into our lives. Jesus says, why are you testing me? And the question is, well, why are they testing him? Why are they testing him? Well, they're not testing him because they think he's true and good and they want to know what he says about an issue. They're just trying to trap him. You see, they don't care about the truth of the issue. They care about the usefulness of the issue in order to get him in trouble. And I see this constantly online and even in individual conversations where it's no longer about truth when you're like, hey man, Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And then you're, 
And then you just get these like politically charged emotional questions where they're only meant to trap you. And here's my, my comment on this. And I think this is what we should learn from it. Heart issues matter. The reason why these Pharisees are not going to follow Jesus is because no matter what he says, they're not going to follow Jesus. They're not interested in truth. They're interested in traps. And I think, and I don't want to assume the hearts of anybody, like, because I'm engaging with people online, I try to just not go there because I don't know them. But there is a heart issue. So I may not be able to, like, diagnose the heart issues of everybody, but at least be aware that these things are there. And the heart issues go like this. When you're challenging Christianity, when you're, uh, I've dealt with some teens like this, you're, you're a 13 year old and you've got all kinds of things you want to do and be that are not consistent with Christianity. And all of a sudden you're like, how do I really know God exists? And so you, you give, you give evidence for God's existence and they go, well, well, I don't know. The Bible hasn't been changed. So you give evidence that the Bible hasn't been changed. And then they ask another question and another question and another question. And you slowly realize they don't care about the answers to the questions. They just want questions, not answers. And this is consistent in Mark. We've seen it over and over again. Okay, I'm kind of repeating myself here, but so is the Bible. And there's a reason for it. When people's heart issues mean that they don't care about the answers, it means that the answers aren't the solution. It's dealing with the heart issues. And in our witnessing and in our sharing and in our ministry to those people, we've got to deal with the heart issues, not just answering the questions. I think that this is wise. For those who care about apologetics like myself, we can just get good at answering questions. And then we just, we, we plug those questions in, whether they, f whether they fit or not, <laughs> you know, like whether it applies or not, whether it's going to help this person or not. And we're just going to answer questions all day long. We got to learn how to tackle some heart issues, kind of like Christ did. Um, one way to do this, uh, Frank Turek does this really well in his um, uh, discussions and dialogues where he'll, at, he'll ask somebody when they ask one of these trap questions, and you can, you can smell them a mile away, the trap questions. He'll ask him a question to help show the heart. He'll say, if you became convinced that Christianity was true, would you truly follow Christ? Would you worship and follow Christ? And if their answer is no, then it means that the answers to their questions aren't what matters. There's a rebellion going on there. If the answer is yes, then it means, boy, I better get them a good answer to this question. So I, that just draws the heart, ash, heart issue out. And for those who are like, you're, you're, you're an atheist skeptic, you're just a non-Christian, you're kind of on the fence. That's the question I have for you today is if Christianity is true and you knew it, would you commit your whole life to Christ? Would you truly worship and follow Jesus Christ, trusting in him, loving him, obeying him? And if your answer is, ah, uh, then there's a spiritual heart issue you're dealing with. And that has to be overcome. That has to be dealt with. Or you won't be able to see clearly because we, uh, we're we committed before we hear the answer. We're committed to our, our conclusion that we're not going to follow. Um. All right, let's look at what Jesus says next. He says, bring me a denarius to look at. Bring me a denarius to look at. And there he looks at a denarius and the, they bring him one. The denarius actually is a silver coin and it had on it the head of Tiberius with an inscription on the on, on that head. And then on the back, it had a chair, woman on a chair, I think it was some kind of deity thing. And then it says um, an inscription on the back. On the front, the inscription says, Tiberius Caesar, Augustus, son of the divine Augustus. This is literally blasphemous money. That is important to me because I think it helps me wrestle through an issue I'll explain in a second when it comes to taxes today. Then on the back, it says Pontifex Maximus, which is to say that he was seen as the high priest. He was considered a religious high priest as the leader of the Romans. And this eventually, this title ended up being adopted by the papacy many, many, many years later, um, the, the, the Pontifex Maximus, um, many years later. But remember that the national coinage was idolatrous because that's one of the problems. So he says, bring me a denarius to look at. Now, before I move on to that, should I make any conclusion? Should I draw anything from the idea that Jesus didn't have any coins with him? That he had to ask them to bring him a denarius? Should I conclude something from that? Well, earlier in the Mark series, and I don't recall off the top of my head which video it was, I went through kind of like seven or eight reasons why we should think that Jesus was poor and not rich. So I already have plenty of a, a case that we've built for that. But I will say this at least adds some support. Neither Jesus nor the apostles seem to have a denarius. He has to get it from these leaders who were very wealthy. Okay, the, the Herodians, the Pharisees, these people are wealthy. And... Um, there's other reasons to support that as well. But I do think this is kind of like a soft reason to add on top of all that other stuff. Jesus doesn't seem to have the money on him. And those who want to say, 
stinking prosperity preachers who want to say that Jesus was super wealthy and that he had his own treasurer, which was Judas, who just carried all Jesus's money around. It's like, well, why, why doesn't the money come out of his own treasury? It, it just seems to be unlikely that he had the money there in the first place. All right. Verse 16, we go on. They brought one, uh, a denarius, and said to him, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things, there we go, that are God's. And they were amazed at him. Let's talk about, before we get into the, the details of the coin, and I, you know, I, I have, um, forgive me for a slight pause here. I have somewhere, there we go. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have, I found it. <laughs> I'm going to have the coin on screen for you so you guys can actually see what uh, the coin with Tiberius's head looks like. Again, these are high, high, not expensive, but they're very collectible. So why does Jesus's answer deflate their prepared accusations, right? They're going to either depopularize him or get him in trouble with Rome. I mean, eventually he does get in trouble with Rome for other reasons, but, but here's a couple reasons why Jesus's clever, clever answer. He doesn't just say yes. He says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's. This brilliant truth that we need in our politics, in our understanding of these things. Uh, well, here's one reason why this deflates their accusations. Uh, one, they're actually spending Caesar's money all the time, so it shows their hypocrisy. Like, you're using Caesar's money, but you're not going to just give the money back to Caesar. And here's already how this impacts my politics. There are some believers who think, um, recklessly, they think, I am a child of God. I shouldn't have to pay taxes to human governments. And I just want to say, say like, show me your bank. Show me, like, are you using the government money? Are you, are you living off of government infrastructure? Is the electricity in your home built by government infrastructure? Are you driving on roads that was built by the government? Look, give to the government what is the government's here. There is a sense in which, and this is, this is huge, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit. We owe the government. Christians, this is a Christian biblical view. We actually owe the government. He says, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. I don't think it's just cute. I think it's a true principle about, about respect and honor and taxes, which the New Testament affirms multiple times that we are to pay these taxes. So one reason why this deflates them, though, is because it shows they're spending Caesar's money all the time. And therefore, you're a hypocrite to be using the things of, of Caesar, but not paying the taxes of Caesar. Uh, two, it's a rabbinic theological argument that um, I didn't used to know about, but it's something about called arguing from the greater to the lesser, greater to the lesser. Here's how it works. And we get it by reversing Jesus's statements. Um, render, the, render to God the things that are God's. Okay, you're in God's image. And this is kind of the, the light bulb moment for you understanding Jesus's phrase here. I'm in God's image. I belong to God. So I should be giving my life to God. I should be serving God, living for God. That's true, and no Jew would argue with that, right? No Jew can argue with that. They're going to have to believe this and affirm it. And then, he, But he uses that as a way of saying, and this image of Caesar's, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Ah, so he's arguing from the greater to the lesser. This is like a very rabbinic, very Jewish way of arguing. And so, yes, we're in God's image. We belong to him in the same way. Currency is in Caesar's image, or, in, in, or, it, or it bears the marks of the government or whatever. So we ought to be paying taxes on those. Uh, finally, it also deflates them because they are using Caesar's coins. So they're not in a, in a position any longer to, um, to argue against Jesus on this topic. Basically, he's revealing their own hypocrisy. If they're going to suggest that paying taxes is wrong while they're using Caesar's money. All right. Finally, um, I say finally. We're not even close to final. I just said it. <laughs> um, this is different than how Jesus handled his questions earlier, if you've noticed. He says, um, where, where do you get the authority to do these things? Where do you get the authority to do these things? And remember they asked him that? The, the, the Sanhedrin asked him that? And then he answers them by asking them a question about John the Baptist. This is not like that. Now, his answer was hidden in the question. His answer here is very much more direct. But again, it's still very clever. He gives them a principle. And the principle is how he comes to his conclusion. And here's got to be our Christian politics. In Christian politics, right? In, in my Christian view of politics, I have to have principles like not being partial to people. not Non-partiality, which I think is one of the most important principles for understanding a lot of the stuff that's going on um, with all the uh, race issues that we're dealing with today. 
is that the biblical principle of non-partiality has to inform me as I step into this realm and try to handle all of these issues. That there's no partiality. Whereas solutions to the race issues sometimes are just more racism right now. And as a biblical Christian, I can't affirm that. As a biblical Christian, I have a principle, no partiality. So when someone's like, well, you don't support this, you don't support that, instead you give them the principle. Well, I think that we shouldn't be partial. I think that we need to be treating all people the same. And that's why I can't do this. And that's why I can't do that. You give them the principle, not just your conclusion. That's the idea. It's more, it's clever that way. Um, don't just answer people, think about your answer. That's what I'm saying. And, and this is where I think Christians, okay, you may have right answers. You might, you might know the right thing to say. You might be saying the true answer, but you may not have given any thought on the right way to say it. And that's what we're getting from Jesus a lot. Something that I think it's almost like nobody talks about, but, or, or at least it doesn't get talked about enough. Proverbs 15, 28 says this though, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. I think this is, this is super applicable today is that you sit and you think, what's the best way to answer this question? Because here's what I see online. I see Christians proclaim truths, but I don't see them tactfully answer questions nearly as often. So you'll, I'll, I'll get it all the time. I'll, I'll, I'll put up uh, something on Facebook where, and I'm proclaiming a truth, that's for sure. And it's in your face, especially recently, I'm putting some in your face things on Facebook. That's true. And there's a time for that. But, but when I post these things, I at least want to try to ponder, how do I make my like, my relative who's like really opposed to my views, how do I make them take a second look at this? How do I make them go, huh, I didn't think of it that way? Or maybe even click like on the thing that is disagreeing with them. Because I wrote it carefully, instead of just being more in your face about it. Right? And how could Jesus be the only way? How could you say Jesus is the only way? Instead of saying like, he is the only way, get over it. Instead, what if I said, what if I said, I just want you to know the love and the truth of God that comes through Christ. And, and, and if, and if he is who he says he is, I want you to know it. And, and it, this is a different perspective, right? It's, it's a different angle. Why don't you want me to live the way I want to live? And instead you, you know, like say transgender or homosexuality, whatever the issue is, instead we respond with, I want you to live in the best possible way that you were designed by God to be. And I don't want you to be deceived by living these false lifestyles that hurt you and others. That's a different way than saying it's a sin. It's just, it's better. Okay. It's just better for reaching people. There's a time for saying that. And, and we are, we're still affirming that, but we're doing what Jesus did. And we're thinking, what's the best way to answer this question? What's the best way? So before you post on social media, this is the Christian truth. Think, how do I build a bridge between them and the Christian truth? How do I access them and the Christian truth? Maybe it's like Jesus, you ask a question instead of giving an answer. And the question leads them to the answer. Maybe it's like Jesus and you give them the principle instead of the plain yes or no answer. And the answer is in there, but it's based on principles that are hard to argue against. And that is good. That is clever. Jesus says he sends us out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Innocent as doves. And, and this is what we need to do. We all understand the innocence, innocent as dove part, but the be as shrewd as a serpent or wise as a serpent. I don't know about you, but I was just like, wise as a serpent? Now, I don't think the serpent here is hearkening back to the Garden of Eden. Um, at least, at least that's not, I don't think the emphasis that's here, but maybe there's, maybe there's a lesson that's there. Like we don't want to be immoral like that, but there's a, there's a shrewdness or a carefulness, a thoughtfulness, a plotting, a planning that goes on. But I think rather we have a parallel of a dove and a serpent, right? And the dove is like gentle and, and peaceful, this wonderful, gentle animal. They're actually very gentle animals. Um, I used to be a dove handler. <laughs> it's one of my many jobs as I was doing ministry full time. Um, but, uh. But the, uh, the serpent, though, is the one that snakes up the tree, waits till the dove is gone, and then eats its eggs, right? That's the snake. It's clever. It's thoughtful. It's camouflaged. It's plotting. It's considering its goals and all this kind of thing. So I want to be like both of those. And an example of this is Paul before the Sanhedrin. It's in Acts 23, and I'm, I'm just going to summarize it for you guys. But in Acts 23, Paul's before the Sanhedrin, this Jewish ruling council I keep telling you guys about. And he's about to get into a whole lot of trouble. But he very cleverly looks around the room and he goes, there's Pharisees here, Sadducees here. I know that they're divided on the issue of the resurrection. So, you know what? I, I just have to read the text to you. It may take an extra moment of our time before we launch into our final section on taxes and politics 
and overhauling our mentality on those issues. But Acts 23, 6, Paul perceives that one group are Sadducees and the other are Pharisees. Paul began crying out in the council, brethren, I'm a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees. I'm on trial for the hope of and the resurrection of the dead. Okay, this is so clever because he's on trial for proclaiming that Jesus was resurrected. But that's not what he says. He says he's on trial for the principle of the resurrection of the dead. And he identifies himself as a Pharisee. And by saying those two things, he gets half the room on his side like that. It's no longer just about Jesus. It's about an issue where he realizes politically they're divided. It's just very clever what he says. Verse 7, and he said, and uh, as he said this, there occurred a dissension between the Pharisees and Sadducees and the assembly was divided. And then the Bible explains to us why they're divided on this issue. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, no, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. So he's kind of, the Sadducees are kind of materialistic, um, material, materialism, <laughs> material, what's the word I'm looking for here? They only believe in the material. Um, and then the physicalists and then, um, in verse 8, it tells us also the Pharisees acknowledge all those things. They believe the resurrection. They believe that there's a, a, a spirit, that humans have a spirit. And Paul is in that camp. So, and there occurred a great uproar. I love this. And some of the scribes of the Pharisaic party stood up and began to argue heatedly, we find nothing wrong with this man. Suppose a spirit or an angel has spoken to him because they view Paul now as in their camp. And supporting him is like supporting what they're already committed to, which is a biblical truth. The resurrection and the spiritual afterlife and all that kind of stuff. And so then they fight and um, argue. And this is Paul just being super clever. He didn't just get up and say, like, Jesus is Lord. He, like, looked around and thought, you know, they're all mad at me, but I could kind of make him s spread that out amongst each other a little bit here. And he's just extremely clever. We ought to be as well. Harmless as doves, but wise as serpents. Be clever about things. And defaulting to principles instead of just proclamations is one way of doing that. All right, let's talk about taxes. Let's talk about what I think is maybe the hardest hitting part of all this. Um, maybe. What if government uses my taxes for evils like abortion, as my government does? And, um, and abortion is an evil. And I have teaching on that if people are interested in hearing you know, more of the biblical and philosophical case for those things, it, it's, it should be clear. But what if they're using it for abortion? Should I still pay taxes? Because I've known people who have said, as a Christian, I feel like I should hold my taxes back because they're using my taxes for immoral things like abortion or an immoral war I don't agree with or immoral policies and the enforcing of policies that I think are immoral. Jesus said for them to still pay taxes to Rome. Like Rome. Rome is not some godly, wonderful good, moral, upstanding nation. They're doing all kinds of wicked, immoral, ungodly things. Jesus is saying to pay taxes to the people who are going to use tax money to crucify him. To crucify him. And yet still pay taxes. Why? Because here's the principle. Christian, you are to pay taxes and you're not responsible for how they're used. You're responsible for paying them. Just like an employer pays an employee, you're not responsible for what they do with their money. You're responsible for paying them. That's just how it works. This means I should still pay taxes if the government is using it for evils like abortion. What if the government's corrupt? Well, the Roman government was corrupt. I mean, part of it was like an accepted corruption. It was just like, it's how it is. Like, we're corrupt. It's just, it's not corruption. It's just how government works. But you still pay taxes because if they were to, then we should as well. What if they overcharge? You still pay. And I think our, my libertarian friends need to, need to know this. Your libertarian principles might be right. You may be right politically. But, and, and you may try to affect change, especially in a democracy where we actually have the ability to, to change the government. But in the meantime, libertarian doesn't need to be an excuse for rebellion. And that's the dangerous line I don't think we want to cross unless we have really extreme justifications for rebellion. But sometimes libertarians, uh, to be, I'm just being honest with you guys, it has to be biblical, right? Sometimes libertarians lower the bar for rebellion and they'll start rebelling very, very quickly, like, like far too quickly. And that's not good. That is not good. Now, what if, um, 
they overcharge. I say still pay, still pay. And there's a principle of the greatest good. So like if if they're overcharging to the point where I can't feed my kids, more my responsibility to feed them is gonna is gonna take over. But if they're overcharging to the point where I can't live in a better house, can't have a nicer car, it's like pay. Because this is the radical Christian submission we're called to. We're called to crazy submission, even in unfair, unjust circumstances, we're called to a lot of submission. This is a Christian view of our politics that we're lacking today, I think. What about, let me give you a better closer to home example, jury duty. This applies to the U.S. I don't know how jury duty works in other countries, but in the U.S., you get a paper, you're supposed to report for ju jury duty. You call in or you show up at the court. Nowadays, you just probably call in or check online. Um, if you get called in, you have to go in for jury duty. And I'm telling you, when I, if I post on Facebook right now, I, I should have done it experimentally, <laughs> except all well, that wouldn't have been honest, but... If I post it on Facebook, hey, I got jury duty, I guarantee you, normally upstanding Christians would be giving me advice in the comments on how I could lie my way out of it. That is ungodly. And it's not the biggest issue in the world, jury duty. But if you're lying your way out of it, if you're deceiving, if you're like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to look like a bigot in the jury selection so they won't pick me. I'll be like, I'm very religious. I'm very I, this and that and da da da. I'm gonna say anything I can to try to get disqualified from this jury. Can I say you're just being ungodly? G now you're like Mike. You're you're going too far. Jesus just said pay taxes, but you know what else Jesus said? He said if someone compels you to go with them one mile, you should go with them two. You know what going with someone a mile was? It's like jury duty. I mean, in the sense that a Roman soldier could walk up to a citizen, a Jewish, not a Roman citizen, but a Jewish citizen, and he could tell them, here, carry my stuff. Here is my junk. You're going to carry it, and you have to walk with me one mile. He could force them to walk one mile. That was allowed. Jesus says, go an extra mile. Go a second mile. I think that applies to jury duty. That's why we call it jury duty. Because it's a duty that is placed upon citizens that we have to perform. And here... Nobody's going to like me because I'm preaching submission to government, but that's our biblical principle. Like we submit, we submit, we submit. A Christian should be able to be seen as a good citizen in almost any government at almost any time. The rare exceptions are like you're in the middle of Nazi Germany during the Holocaust and you're hiding Jews in your home and you're working against the Nazi party and all that because of these overriding moral concerns. The problem is that we often take moral concerns that aren't really legitimizing our rebellion and we have all these different levels and layers of rebellion. Well, I should have the right to do this, so I'm just going to do it. I think that that is not a biblical principle. Submit to government is the biblical principle. This is Romans 13. Let me read this to you guys. And I'm going to highlight something you may have never noticed. Romans 13, 1 through 7. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities and do not think for a second that they had these wonderful godly governing authorities. The Jewish and Roman leadership was not good. For there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Every president the U.S. has ever had. Whoever is president next, established by God. So be subject to them. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God and they will have a... Um, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Now there's exceptions and we even read about these in scripture, right? There's times to rebel. I'm teaching on this in my Romans series when I was going through Romans 13. Like when do I rebel? When is it that it's justified? So I talk about that in Romans 13 from a while back. But the general rule is just real radical submission. Then verse 3, for rulers are not a cause of for of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from, from the same. The idea is that that's, that's the purpose of rulership is that they would um, cause the troublemakers to be afraid. And uh, for it is a minister of, of God to you for good. This is the biblical view of politics is that government is actually under God. Like when we say in, in our American way, one nation under God, like that's just a fact of reality. And it doesn't mean that we're a godly nation. It means we're under God. That's what it means. That's what it should mean. And, and this is true of Pakistan. Pakistan is one nation and they're under God, whether they like it or not. This is true of Turkey and of Norway. This is true of every nation on the planet. You're under God, whether you like it or not, because God has established your authority and he'll hold your authorities accountable to him for godliness and he'll hold you accountable for submission because he's the one ultimately in control. It doesn't mean they're, they do good things. 
always. That's not the point. Um, for it's a minister of God for you, uh, to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword uh, for nothing or in vain. For it is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. And for those who think that government should never invoke um, harm to the to people who break the law, like actual harm that comes upon them because of the law, that's actually not biblical. Here's a biblical political view: is that um, you don't. Why would you disarm the? I'm just being honest, guys. This is this is biblical. Okay, I don't care about Republican Democrat issues. I care about biblical issues. And where biblical issues overlap those, I want to still be biblical. And where they disagree with those, I want to disagree with them. Okay, but you don't disarm the police because they don't bear the sword for nothing. This is part of God's design for government is that they have the power to enforce the law with weapons. Like that would be a biblical view. I know that's not popular. I don't care. It needs to be our Christian biblical view because I'm committed to scripture. I'm committed to God. I'm committed to his truth. And I'm not trying to pick sides in political fights. I'm trying to be a Christian in this world. Then verse five. It gets worse. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Don't just do it because you're afraid you'll get hurt. Do it because of the rightness of it. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Oh, man. More tax stuff. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them. Now, here's the thing you may not have never ever noticed. Due. That word due. What is owed. What, it, what belongs to them. Tax to whom tax is due. The assumption here is that whatever tax the government happens to be putting on people, even when it's more than they should, that you're supposed to pay it. That's just a general Christian truth. Because Christianity is not interested in overhauling systems as much as it is in creating godly people. And then that spills into the systems. It's like how the Bible deals with slavery. It, it makes it so that no matter where you are, whether you were you were the, the, the owner or the slave, you would be such a wonderful person that no harm would happen in this system. Whatever system you put Christianity into, it'll overhaul the people so they're godly and loving and kind and gracious and pure and submissive. That's what we're talking about. Overhauling people, not just systems. This is a biblical principle. This is a biblical principle where the people are changed, not just the system. Now, sometimes changing systems is good, but I'm just saying this is the emphasis in scripture is overhauling me. So tax to whom taxes do. You know what this means? This means that when you buy a, a, a car, private sale, and you get the pink slip and you can write any number you want on there because the guy's trying to be a cool guy. So he's like, write whatever you want on there. You write the amount you actually paid and you pay the whole taxes on your new purchase. This isn't some super godly moment. This is just what is owed. What is owed? Then it gets worse. Custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Wait. I owe honor to people in government? Wait a minute. This is utterly and completely counter to what we see in our, in many cases in our pulpits, um, in many cases in our, in our Christians. We don't honor our leadership. Now, how do you do this when your leadership is a scoundrel, is immoral, is a womanizer, is corrupt? And I'm not, you, you, you probably think, you, you think you know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about an awful lot of our leadership here. How do I do this properly? I think you, you, you just have a rule where you don't compromise your character in the way you interact with their character. So you give honor to whom honor. And this I, one principle I heard years ago that I thought was very helpful in this is saluting the rank, not the person. As a Christian, I need to be honoring the president of the United States when he is Donald Trump, when he is Barack Obama, or if he ends up being Joe Biden, or if she ends up being Kamala Harris. I need to honor the president of the United States, whether they're, whether they're godly, whether they're a scoundrel. I'm going to give them honor because of their position, not because of their character. And that's what Romans is all about here. This is about a position of authority that has been given by God. By honoring that, I'm honoring God. So the, the thing I heard years ago is salute the rank, not the person. And I think that's a very helpful thing. I salute the rank, not the person. I owe them honor because of their rank, because of the authority structure that God has set up. The person just happens to be in that role. But I'm not going to devalue the role. And, and that's, I think, where our Christian politics should be shifted here a lot. 
um, I find, as maybe you do too, and some of you are like, Mike, you're just saying lots of stuff today, buddy. Well, I think that these are biblical truth things that we do need to apply. And I'm not going to try, I'm not trying to fix all your politics. Um, I'm trying to apply this text of scripture into our politics. I think that Christians are very honoring when they have a president they like. And this goes on both sides. Okay. There are Christians that, that are very, have very liberal, um, very, you know, democratic kind of sensibilities. And they are very honoring to guys like Barack Obama. And yet the conservatives say lots of things about Barack Obama. And then Donald Trump's in office and the roles switch, which tells me that neither of these people are operating from biblical integrity. They're operating from party affiliations. That's the problem. I am a Christian. All my politics, as much as possible, I want to be informed by my Christian faith. And that does affect how I vote and how I view things, whether it's the, these Democrat issues, those Republican issues, the, these libertarian issues. It does affect those things, and rightly so. And some Christians, well, in, in all reality, we all should be gearing more towards certain parties than others because we have biblical principles in place. Like, that's just reality. It's not like we're on the fence on everything. But the, the important thing is that it's based on biblical truth, based on commitment to Christ. And I hope I'm making my, my point here. It means that I'm still going to honor those I disagree with. That means that if... I'm in Iraq and Saddam Hussein is, is, is the leader of my country. While I have no respect for the man, I respect the office and the position. Uh, if I, if it, it doesn't matter what your role is or what your, um, your country is or how messed up your leadership is, they could be totally corrupt and you could be praying that God would take them out of office because you think they're totally evil and messed up, whoever it is. You still give honor to the, to the office and you salute the rank. I think this is hugely important. Um, first Peter two thirteen gives us a great principle for this two thirteen. So consistent, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether the King is one of one in authority or governors and he goes on, but here's what I want you to highlight for the Lord's sake. The Christian sees their interaction with government, not as here's politics, here's religion. No, they think here's a Christian. Here's a Christian engaging in politics. Here's a Christian engaging in whatever the sphere is. So when I submit, I'm doing it for God. I'm doing it for the Lord. And this tells me exactly when I rebel. When you are telling me to disobey my God, I rebel against you. Not, I don't, I'm not going to go start fires in innocent business owners' homes. Like that's, that's, that would be sinful. This is clear from any, <laughs> it's, do I have to explain? <laughs> um, that would be sinful. No, but I'm not going to obey commands to do things against my God. Why? Because I'm only obeying for the Lord's sake. But because I'm obeying for the Lord's sake, it doesn't matter who's in office. I can obey for God. I can obey for him. I think it's, I think it's real simple. So um, that's the radical thing we miss in Romans 13 there is that we owe government. We actually, we owe government. We owe government. This is a Christian view. I owe them obedience, Romans 13, right? Because I rendered all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, and then fear and honor. And he's talking about government. This is not really an American value. We're brutal to our leaders unless we agree with them. We need to be far more dignified and subject to the leadership we have. We need to learn to salute the rank better than we do as Christians, as leaders, even when we think they're they're wicked, they're ungodly, I'm coming against them. And, um, and yeah. I just think what happens is this. We're afraid we're going to give some ground to the party we oppose. Some ground to those who we oppose. So we don't hold to Christian values in all cases because sometimes those values might might hurt the rhetoric we have against the other side. It doesn't matter because we're doing all things for the Lord's sake. So we need to do that. We need to do that. So I, I think that, yeah, again... Um, uh, there are times in America where you, you think, but I have a constitutional right that's in conflict with the government, so I think I'm making a decision to obey the constitutional right. Like, I'm not really rebelling. I'm just obeying the actual founding documents and stuff. I'm not trying to argue against that. That's a complicated issue, and there may come to be a time for that. I'm just saying, let's not be, let's not have a rebellious spirit about it. Let's do it because of just simple Christian convictions. Um, there's something else I wanted to mention. Let me find it in my notes.
Yeah, I guess that was that. So let's talk about the image of God for a minute, and then then I'm going to tell you guys what I have coming up this week. There's a lot coming actually soon here. And I'm really interested in hearing the comments on this video. Now, listen, you disagree with me on something. I'm sure a lot of you do. Um, I'll watch the comments. Don't just say Mike's wrong about that. Tell me why I'm wrong specifically so I can change my mind. That's my challenge to you. Don't just say I'm wrong. Tell me spe very, very specifically. And if you misrepresent what I said, I'm going to ignore you. <laughs> Why do I say that? Because I've been reading comments for a while now. All right. So why Jesus? Uh, why does Jesus redirect from taxes to God? And this is this is this is one of the main points we have today. He's he's like you're asking a question about taxes. I'm going to talk about the image of God. You belong to God, and that's a principle that informs your view of taxes. You know, this image of Caesar belongs to Caesar. In the same sense, my Christian value of, of living for, serving, loving, knowing God. That is why I'm going to do everything I'm doing in politics. There is no separation in the Christian's heart between religion and politics. When we separate the, the two, it needs to be because I will not allow politics to tell me how to be religious. That's the separation from a, from a Christian's perspective. Um, politics has no, no rulership over my service and following of God. Um, you know, I'm not going to, if there's a conflict there. Then, um, yeah, you guys, th that's pretty much, I mean, I've dumped a ton of stuff on you guys. I'm really interested in hearing your feedback. I, I have not talked much about these types of issues in quite a while, and we're in a hot time right now, but I just happen to deal with, I mean, we're in Roman, uh, excuse me, we're in Mark chapter 12. We just come across one of the most political passages in the New Testament. So I'm just teaching what we get verse by verse as we go through here. I'm not sure how it will affect you, but I'm very curious to read what you have to say in the comments. Um, we're going to pray, but before we do that, I just want to announce... I have on Wednesday an interview with Lydia McGrew that's going to be coming on my channel. It'll be live at 4 p.m. Pacific time. And it's going to be a long interview, like a two-hour conversation about controversies in scholarship related to the Gospels. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke in particular we're going to probably focus on. And there's some stuff there that I think is valuable to talk about. Um, you know, what kind of reliability do we see there? And obviously I believe they're inerrant, but we're going to have a discussion about it. And... Then Friday, we have the Q&A. Next Monday, I'm not going to do the Mark series. I'm going to do a, a, a treatment of the Mirror Bible. The Mirror Bible is a Bible that was recommended to me by several of the viewers who wanted me to look at it. It's the worst, I'm not exaggerating, it's the worst Bible translation I've ever seen. And you'll see why next Monday. I'm going to get into the details of that. And then we'll be back on the Mark series the following week. And then next Wednesday, ironically, on 1028, I'm going to have an interview with Neil Shenvey. And we're going to talk about critical race theory. More importantly, we're going to talk about a biblical view of wokeness. Okay, this is this is my my drive, my commitment is I want to be biblical in these issues. And I'm worried that we're being formed by political parties more than our biblical commitments. And so we're going to be trying to say, look, let's make sure that our view of the world and others, justice, all that kind of stuff is biblical. So we're going to be tackling those issues and I bring in Neil Shenvey on to help us work through some of that because I think he's good at that. So that'll be it. Uh, let's pray. And some tough pills to swallow today. I hope, hope I did scripture justice. I hope that you have a receptive heart as well. Let's pray. Father, we ask for wisdom. We ask for wisdom. Um, we, don't, I don't, we don't want to be Republicans and Democrats, Lord, um, or, or just libertarians. I mean, there may be right values in those things, but they're all insufficient systems and the values are all insufficient because we want to start as Christians. We want to be committed to Jesus Christ, committed to the Lordship of Christ, committed to the teachings of Scripture about politics, about taxes, about government, about due and what we owe. Help us to understand that we actually owe honor and fear in the good sense that we owe these things. Help us to be such incredible citizens in whatever situation we find ourselves in, Lord, that even in an ungodly state, we find ourselves being godly. And we pray that we would not compromise with the vitriol and the venom that is going on right now in our political stuff. Um, we can take strong stances. We can call things out as they are, but we just don't become sinful in the midst of it all. So we please give us wisdom, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you all for, uh, for joining, and I will see you on Wednesday, hopefully. Take care.